I would um, maybe ask a question, um, and this is a question that um, we are somehow trying to, to answer, or we, or we think that we have the answer, uh, but still is, um, Last and every century has its own art form. Um, and last century we had photography and film. The first century where technology started to become an, become an art form. Um, and my question is, what will be the art form of the 21st century? Sergio Ardalan is a serial entrepreneur from Austria with a passion for pushing boundaries. He's the CEO and co-founder of Artivive, which is a startup venture founded in 2017 that fuses haptic and digital art with the captivating power of augmented reality. Art of Ive is the AR solution for artists and has the vision to change how art is created and consumed. Art of Ive has offices in Europe, the US, and China, and an amazing community of over 250,000 creatives spanning 190 countries. Art of Ive is collaborating with some of the most renowned museums and galleries in Vienna, Munich, San Francisco, Seoul, and Shanghai. You'll hear in the episode how the art scene is embracing augmented art to explore new dimensions of artistic expression. Prior to Art of Ive, Sergio founded a highly successful augmented reality agency right in the heart of Vienna that served big names like Volkswagen and Audi, making waves in 42 countries around the world. Sergio and I met at the Bold Unconference, a fantastic and inspiring event that the Austrian Chamber of Commerce hosted across four cities in Austria, including a stop in Linz for Ars Electronica. And I'm so excited to share our conversation with you today that started on a charter bus from Salzburg to Vienna, where I got to see postcards come to life with Art of Ive. I couldn't be more excited to have Sergio on the show. In today's episode, you'll discover how to move AR beyond a gimmick but as a medium to add value to enhance stories and experiences around art. You'll hear case studies about museums and independent artists using Art of Ive to bring artworks to life. Sergio discusses how Art of Ive uses AI and machine learning and also shares his thoughts on the new Apple Vision Pro and how AR glasses will become more seamlessly integrated into our lives. Sergio sees AI as a tool that can enhance human creativity and storytelling versus replace it, and that human creativity will always be needed. Sergio believes that art will adapt and use new mediums as a mirror of society. He also asks, what will be the art form of the 21st century? Enjoy. Welcome to Creativity Squared. Discover how creatives are collaborating with artificial intelligence in your inbox, on YouTube, and on your preferred podcast platform. Hi, I'm Helen Todd, your host, and I'm so excited to have you join the weekly conversations I'm having with amazing pioneers in the space. The intention of these conversations is to ignite our collective imagination at the intersection of AI and creativity to envision a world where artists thrive. Well, Sergio, it is so wonderful to have you on the show. Welcome to Creativity Squared. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for the invitation. I was looking forward the whole day to it. Well, it's so good to have you uh, for our listeners and viewers. Uh, we met in Austria at the Bold Unconference that the Austrian Chamber of Commerce uh, put together, and it was absolutely wonderful. Our guest, uh, Walter was also from the conference, and I'm so excited to hear all about uh, Art of Ive today. Uh, but let's start with like your origin story and how you ended up in Austria, because you're not native-born like Walter is. <laughs> exactly. That's a great, uh, great question. So um, I was born in, in Romania, in, in Transylvania, actually, also like my last name of them is Transylvanian. Um, and during my high school, um, I started, you know, doing graphics on the computer. And this was like the end of the 90s. And um, I fell in love with it. So I somehow um, decided this is what I want to study. This is uh, what I want to do, you know, <laughs> um, in, in my life. And um, I started searching for universities in Romania. And back then, um, all the universities in Romania didn't have a website, so I had to, to travel around the country and um, find, uh, you know, the universities and see what they're offering. And it was very disappointing to see that um, none of the university, or universities had anything, you know, with multimedia and, and graphics. It was 
either design, that means like, you know, that you're drawing and, you know, learning and studying design, or computers, so um, development, programming. And I was like, I, I don't want none. It's like, I want, you know, be creative with technology, with computers. Um, so then um, when I was in Bucharest, and this is a funny story that I want to tell you. Um, I was, um, you know, disappointed. And I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. And I really want to do this. Um, so I suppose I, um, you know, want to go and study abroad. Um, and I saw a phone booth. Um, we had that back then. Um, and in the, in the phone booths, um, there were also, um, you know, the phone books. <laughs> where you'll find all the names of everybody with the phone numbers and the address. Um, so I looked up at embassies and Austria was pretty on the top. Um, so I found out the address, went there. There was like this police guy and um, he was like, what do you want? It was like, I want to study in Austria. And it's like, I have no idea, go inside. Um, and they somehow managed to, 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 you know, to get and to talk to the, to the cultural attaché from the Austrian embassy. And it was like, this is amazing, you know, um, in Austria, we have more and more universities offering this, and there's a new one, which is in Upper Austria, and I think it's a good fit. So long story short, um, I landed on a train <laughs> and went um, to the university, and they were like, this is great, we have now the exams, and it was like, aha, interesting, you have exams. Um, so I did that. Um, and then afterwards, I also had an interview. And then was the moment that I learned that there were like 700, um, you know, students wanted to grab one of the 70 um, seats that they had, like 70, um, you know, spots for for the for the year. Uh, and I was like, oh, I will not make it. It's like I didn't came prepared. They also speak in German. Um, but then um, I got received a call after a few weeks, and they said, yeah, pack your things and come to Austria. And um, I thought that um, it will be for the studying and then I will go back home <laughs> and, and start my career there. Uh, but this happened 22 years ago and I'm still here. <laughs> well, I love that you uh, landed in Austria and it was from like the top of the phone book. Uh, yeah. Had there been another country, you could be in a totally different uh, uh, city or country, uh, depending on which page you open to. So I, I love that. It was funny because I thought that, you know, if it works so well with Austria, um, why I, I shouldn't try with other countries? So I, I went to the German embassy and tried the same thing. And they were like, OK, it's, you know, this is an embassy that's not a university. So if you want to study in Germany, <laughs> like find a way to study in Germany. Uh, so it was just Austria that was so open. Um, and, you know, I, I had the opportunity to talk to, to somebody who knew what's happening in Austria and had me decide to go there or come here. <laughs> I, I love that. And um, from your school schooling in Austria to where you're at today as the CEO of Artivive, can you uh, tell us that that story, like your founder's story? Because what you're doing is so cool. And it's at the very like cutting edge of art and uh, augmented reality right now. Um, yeah, of course, sure. <laughs> um, you know, it's the moment that um, I also came to Austria and, and decided to, to go on the creative path, uh, I would say. Um, I, I saw myself always as a creative, but also very much in love with technology. So um, back then in the 2000s, I didn't really find my fit. You know, it was just when people were talking about if, um, you know, somebody or a company needs a website or if emails are better than fax. So that was a time where, you know, I was um, creating digital artworks, if you can say um, this, um, and also fascinated of how you can be creative um, using different um, tools um, and software. So um, when, when I started studying, um, this was my focus, but um, the university also gave me a very holistic um, understanding of the technology and also how to develop the program, how systems are built. Um, I also, you know, learned to, to put hardware together. Um, we also had um, film classes uh, where we were acting and, and filming and the same with audio. Um, so I had a very holistic um, approach on everything that's multimedia, but also with a creative touch. Um, and I think that was um, the, the ground for, you know, um, what, Artivive is today, because um, when I came out of university, 
um, I had to sustain myself. My whole family uh, wasn't still in, still is in Romania, so I had to find a way to earn money. Um, and um, the low hanging fruit was marketing, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because um, it was creative. Um, it you know it was discovering technology, um, and it was well paid. So um, I started working at the agency, um, and I was a little bit disappointed. I worked there like for two years um, that they weren't you know really. Uh, being um, at the state of the art, what I learned at the university, and they weren't applying it in marketing. And the trials from my position is like, hey, we could do this campaign, and we could use this software. Um, that was also the rise of um, uh, flash websites, uh, where it was like the, <laughs> I would say the the first attempt of the metaverse, where you could go in a you know in a website and have um, an, an experience and entertainment there. Um, so I didn't really um, had um, you know the, the the path at the agency that um, I was looking for, um, and with a friend with with Clement, um, we decided to somehow build our own agency. He was already doing something in this direction, and um, he had like a technology developed together with Sony, uh, where they could produce on mass CDs, um, but with the code inside. And with this code, we could personalize the CDs. So um, we had the idea to create the CDs like direct marketing. You imagine that you know you receive um, a CD with a mail, and you have a digital content on it, which is also personalized. Um, and again, this was back in the 2000s, <laughs> so CDs were cool. <laughs> 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 and and before because we started doing that, we somehow and also with the amazing skills of Clemens to sell um, everything, we managed to to win um, Volkswagen and Audi Audi as um, our clients, and then our agency grew very fast. We also opened an office in Shanghai. Uh, we did campaigns all over the world, um, and at some point. Um, um, Apple decided um, that we don't need CDs anymore, so they weren't building hardware with CD support. Um, so we had a, a problem. It's like because that was more or less our business model, um, and we had an idea. Okay, we can go with the technology and now use USB sticks, uh, but unfortunately they were much more expensive, and also the production was, um, you know, took longer than um, you know pressing CDs. So um, that didn't work out the way that we wanted. But then it was a little bit, um, we went to uh, FAIR, um, the Mobile Congress, the World, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And there was a very small stand uh, from a company called Metayo. And they were talking about augmented reality. <laughs> So um, we, we talked with them um, and that was fascinating. It's like, imagine how amazing it will be if we could use augmented reality for our clients like Volkswagen to do marketing. Um, and then we started working with Metayo. Uh, we won over uh, Volkswagen, so we started doing um, AR campaigns. Um, and back in the day was, for the I, this was 2010, 11. Uh, it was groundbreaking, also the te technology, so you could you know, position your car in the living room or in front of your house change the different colors um, of the car and the rims and you know just see it live in front of you or scan um, you know an ad uh, when we're waiting for the bus uh, or in, in a magazine and then see the car in 3d um, we loved it um, as well as our client um, but um, after a few years we saw that um, the engagement um, and the users weren't as expected and I tried to understand why. So I started having interviews and understanding uh, where is the problem, why um, aren't they, you know, um, so um, amazed <laughs> by the technology and, and the content as we uh, were and our client. And um, I just realized and afterwards that we weren't really creating um, a value. It was more like a gimmick. And I think this is an issue for um, many uh, implementations or projects or products um, in, in the space because it's just a very interesting and gimmicky way to show information, but it's not necessarily the shortest way. Um, this means, for example, um, you know, if, if you want to see how a color, like the, the, the car could look in different colors, you already maybe have the catalog in front of you. 
um, or you, you can you know um, see in the dealership how the different colors look um, in real. It's not just a three D rendering. Um, we also have um, had an implementation with um, manual where you could get into the car and scan the dashboard and have all the information. Uh, but we see that people rather with Google is like, what does this button do, right? <laughs> Instead of installing an app. And um, I was um, a little bit disappointed after the whole work um, that we put in and also being on the creative side. And I was also after 11 years of marketing, I was like, ah, this, uh, <laughs> it's not really the space that I want to be in. Um, and after I had, um, um, a time off, like half a year, and um, was able to travel the world, um, came back um, and had this idea, is like, what would happen if we take this technology, strip it of everything which is technical, and make it like, you know, a no-code solution for artists? How would they use the technology? How would they start telling narratives? And um, when I had this idea, I called my friend, Kodin, who was my, my co-founder, and it's like, I, I think I have something. I think it will be something that will, um, you know, will have um, a lot of fun building. I'm not sure how far we'll be going with it because it's still in arts and culture. Uh, but I think there is something about it. And um, I pitched him the idea. I can remember I visited him. We went to, you know, um, the, the, the pizzeria that was uh, <laughs> across of his house uh, and had like canned beer <laughs> and, and chatting about the idea. And he was like, I understood um, like 50% of what you said, but you seem very, very, um, you know, um, um, believer in, in the idea and, and um, the outcome. So let's try it. And this was 2000, uh, end of 2016. So 2017, we, we started um, the, the idea and um, our road <laughs> together. And uh, here we are. After six years, we have a little bit more than a quarter of um, million of artists all around the world work with our platform. That's amazing. And congratulations to, uh, for six years, I know, uh, and yeah, over a quarter million users. That's amazing. And I love that you said that flash was the first entry to the metaverse. <laughs> I haven't heard that before, so I, I might borrow that. Yeah, um, sure. and you, <laughs> and you kind of um, explained the the no code and the AR, but can you tell us more like what artists can do with Artivive uh, in terms of like bringing their art alive and like how, how it actually functions? Because I, I know we'll put stuff on the website, um, but a lot of people will just be listening. So can you kind of uh, help us visualize the experience? Yes, yes. Um, it's a little bit hard. Um, I, I always, um, as you can remember, I have my postcards and my business cards, we are, which are some artworks because this is the easiest way to showcase what we're doing. Um, but I will try my best. So imagine how, um, you know, the traditional art world, um, if we're looking at um, museums and galleries, um, would be connected with the digital art world with NFTs, metaverse, animations, GIFs, artists that are just in the digital space. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring these two worlds together and an artwork, um, which can be, again, something that's in a museum, in a gallery, but can be also street art or can be a tattoo or can be a sticker or, you know, can be a piece of fashion, can be extended with a digital story. So if you're looking through the phone for now, and we hope that the glasses will come. <laughs> um, you can see this piece of art come to life with a digital narrative. That means, imagine that you have a poster um, that has a message, um, like, don't look here, for example, and then you scan it, and then this message is transforming to something else. You know, the story is going further or it's, uh, you know, shifting is like, thank you for looking. <laughs> and you have somebody who's telling you a story. So I think um, the idea is that we want to, to bring artists to see themselves and work in both spaces, right? So uh, a traditional artist that's maybe just a painter, just, <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's focusing on painting, um, would also be able to show the process. So just a recording of how he's painting um, and show how the painting is you know, made so to give a different context to the person which is looking at the painting. Um, or you know, using a 
different digital storytelling behind it. So to, to enhance or to um, extend the artwork also in a digital space. And at the same time, imagine um, you know a digital artist that can hang um, in in a museum like uh, MoMA without a screen, without a projection, um, to just be a painting or just be an illustration which is framed um, and on a wall. So I think this is like the bigger vision that we have, um, and how we manage to do this is that you have. Um, you know, a platform or um, an editor where you can just upload an image, which can be um, the represent or it is the representation in the reality. We call it trigger, <laughs> and then the digital extension, which can be literally anything from just sound, another image, a video, or three D model, a particle system, uh, a text, whatever you want. You can just you know um, connect these two parts, and then um, the artwork become one which will have two representations, one in the haptic real world and one in the interactive digital world. I, I love that you're bridging uh, the virtual and the real world together for artists and making it super easy. I have one of the postcards, which I haven't uh, shown my nephew yet, but uh, I should already say thank you for making me look like a very cool aunt. Because uh, it was it is really cool to see in person because uh, I think how you explained it to us uh, in Austria is like more or less you're taking the artwork and turning it into a QR code, right? That yeah. the that the phones read and then they come alive uh, from that. Uh, so yes, it's, it's very cool to see in person. It's, it has like this very magic uh, element to it. For the podcast listener, maybe listeners, maybe um, it would work also to go on our Instagram. <laughs> We're featuring there every day, a new artist. Um, it will be Artivive app is our handle. So, um, yeah, just feel free maybe during listening to just um, see some of the artworks, then maybe it makes more sense what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll uh, I'll be sure to include all of the the links to everything in the the dedicated episode post. Um, well, in because the show uh, is about how creatives are collaborating with AI, and I know you uh, talked a lot about the AR, but we're uh, I'm sure just on the back end tech side that AI plays a role in Artivive. So I'd love to hear uh, uh, where AI fits into what you do. Um. So we already use AI for some time now. So um, like you mentioned, um, the, the image becomes a QR code. We have an AI model behind it, which is recognizing um, the artwork and then you know can deliver the content that is linked to it and also track it. So we already have um, you know, parts behind it where we have machine learning, uh, learning um, you know, how to um, find the right artwork or to um, link it to the, to the right digital extension. Um, and what we also see here, um, and the thing is like, you know, the AI is now moving so fast. Um, so I just realized, you know, that one year ago about this time, we didn't have ChatGPT. Right. Uh, so we had it, but, you know, people weren't using it. It wasn't open for everybody. It was, you know, version two or one. Um, and um, it exploded. And I just saw um, yesterday, I think Canva presented um, that, you know, Canva is magic now. You can do everything that you want. We, I could just type in something and then um, Canva will, will produce something uh, for you, um, which is amazing at the same time. Um, but in, in some uh, cases, not exactly <laughs> what you needed. And in, in the most discussions that we have with our creatives, we see that um, some um, are um, you know, loving it um, and then see the opportunities of how they can um, use it in their work. And others are a little bit afraid of um, you know, what is the value of what I'm creating. If anybody can you know, just type in something um, and then they have something that's, that's similar to uh, where I'm working for weeks um, to create the quality and what I want. Um, so for in, in, in our case is we really want to understand what is the value of the technology. Um, and yesterday I was um, listening to a presentation of um, Stefan Sagmeister, his um, Austrian um, graphic uh, designer um, living um, in the US. Um, he did all the um, album covers for big 
brands, uh, bands um, in the US and all over the world. And um, he said something very interesting, um, which, um, you know, I, I, I resonate with it. At some point, um, the creations that are coming with AI start to look very similar. Um, and it's easier to recognize that it was created with an AI. And um, people, you know, at the beginning are fascinated, but then start getting bored because there is somehow something missing. And he was comparing it with um, Photoshop. So he um, studied graphic design in the 80s. <laughs> so he went through all the technologies that came and said, when it was Photoshop came out, everybody was like, oh, this is amazing. And how easy it is. And then um, after a few months, everybody had the same um, effects, the same designs, the same type of layout, um, which were based also on the limitations on Photoshop good at that time. So I think it's um, how our approach is, is like, how can we build tools that are using AI to help our artists tell the story that they want to tell? And I think a great example is, you know, how um, this tool uh, which was um, called Remove Background, I, I think it's still out there, uh, came out and you just had to put an image in and say, remove background, and with AI, they could identify what the background was. Um, and it was removed in, um, in minutes. It's a work that nobody loves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the AI is dazzling, does, uh, does it in five seconds um, instead of you know, minutes or you know, half an hour if you do it by hand. So I think um, our approach in this way is like, how can we you know, find tools to help the, the creatives um, create the digital content that they want to, to tell the story that they want to, without necessarily, um, you know, to emphasize AI. It's like to just use AI because it's out there and everybody's talking about it. Uh, but maybe there is um, another technology that makes sense. So for example, we have now um, um, launched um, two new features. One is um, where we have particle systems, something that it's out there for, uh, for many years. And, and for those who don't know particle systems, can you tell us what they are? Because um, I don't know what they are, so I'm assuming some of my <laughs> listeners won't know either. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I'm so <laughs> deep in it. Um, and and, and it, it's very interesting because when we launched it, we um, internally we were talking about particle systems, but we changed the name into effects. So what you can imagine is like you can um, 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 create, um, um, how should I describe it the best, uh, like a point cloud, like a points that can be have different shapes and behave in different ways. Um, sounds very technical, but it's extremely easy. So for example, you can create fire, rain, clouds, um, you know, a smoke, whatever you feel, you know, that it has very many small items. Um, and then you can just create it in, in a few clicks. Um, so we, we added this um, a few weeks ago, and we see how much um, it adds, you know, to to some of the artists that they just want to add a little bit of a, um, a backstory or a little bit of a, a feeling to the artwork, and it's enough if you just put a little bit of rain, and then you have a totally different feeling um, to the content that you're looking at. So yes, um, and, and that's not necessarily something that um, it's built with AI, uh, but maybe in the next version, we'll have something that um, it, it has some AI elements to make it a little bit faster or to go in a different direction um, that will help the artists to um, create different content. Um, we also added um, another feature, um, um, I think last week, uh, with 3D audio, so you can you know position audio elements, and if you're going closer, you start hearing it if you're going um, a little bit farther away um, it's uh, you know out of your hearing uh, spectrum so um, i think the same approach like with these features um, uh, we will have with ai to see okay what's out there um, how can we add value um, also based on the feedback that we get from the community in helping um, telling the story because at the end you know, it's um, nobody really cares if it's augmented reality, if it was done with um, AI or not. They are catched by the story, uh, by the approach. And I think this is something that it's um, more sustainable. And this is what we learned during the last six years. Um, because it's at the beginning, when, when we started um, with, with the first projects, we had a lot of 3D um, objects 
you know, connected to artworks in the room. And we saw that many people going to the gallery or museum were struggling to understand what's happening. It's like, this is interesting, it's like a 3D thing, uh, but I don't understand the story. I don't understand what it's trying to tell me. But when we started using, um, you know, formats that they already knew, audio, video, GIFs, they were much more interested in experiencing the, the technology because they weren't caring about the technology anymore. <laughs> uh, they would try to understand the story behind it. Yeah, I, I love that. I think the any time that the technology is front and center, it actually takes away. Like it, it's the magic of the experience that you shouldn't even feel the technology to to understand it. Um, and, and I love what you said about adding value and not being gimmicky either, because there's so many gimmicky things. Like here in Cincinnati, where I'm headquartered, I think there was a bar with like an AI, I don't know, monkey machine or something, but it was just like... <laughs> totally gimmick pounce uh, on the trend. Um, but you did mention um, that some art museums are using Artivive to bring uh, the artworks alive. So I'd love to hear um, some of those use cases and uh, how museums are using this and the, uh, the reaction uh, from, from those who are interacting with, with the art pieces. Um, so we have different um, projects and approaches. Um, we um, try to... Um, help our community and the artists to get in touch with these institutions um, and you know work together because also for the museums is important to activate the local community and the easiest way is to work with living artists from the community because they also understand a little bit better you know the, the holistic um, um, representation of the museum with the collection that they have and also with the people that are coming to the museum. Um, but I have a few examples. <laughs> um, so, um, for example, we did a um, project with uh, the Belvedere Museum in Vienna. I don't know if you had the chance to visit it um, before you left uh, Vienna. But they have uh, an amazing collection from Egon Schiele. And um, interesting enough, there are some paintings that um, have... Uh, unbelievable story behind it which everybody who works at the museum knows the story but it's very hard to tell the story to somebody who's maybe coming the first time to, to Vienna and to the museum um, so I have um, or we have an example from a painting that um, Sheila had to overpaint because when he presented um, the first version of it to the director of the museum at the time the director said, um, unfortunately, the lady who's depicted in the painting is dressed too poorly to uh, match the collection that he had. Um, and the lady in the painting was actually Sheila's wife. <laughs> so, um, and she dress was dressed poorly because they were poor. So um, what he did was went back um, to his studio and um, overpainted the painting with a different dress. So um, it matched more the vision that the museum director had at that time to be able to sell the artwork. And now we have this artwork in the museum with um, you know, the, the vision or the, the final version um, that wasn't um, as intended uh, by the artist. And what we managed to do was, um, through the research that the museum did and um, the colleagues there, we were able, together with them, to recreate the first version and how it looked like. And we were able to use augmented reality to show the first version on the original so that um, you know people can see the difference and also understand the story at the same time. And funny enough, if you're looking very close to the painting that we have today with the backstory and also knowing how the dress looked before, you can see some of the details um, beneath the version that you have today. And I think this is uh, the most valuable experience that people would take with them because only this story is telling so much about the artist, the time that he lived in, about the museum, the, the building that they are in, how old it is, that um, the director of that gallery was able to buy from the living artist that uh, you know died 100 years ago. 
and also to recognize on the original the first version of the painting and understand how this painting come to be what it is. Um, and this is like an experience that's very hard um, you know, also to, to talk about it <laughs> if you don't have the images. And this was a problem also for, um, you know, the, the tour guides that were in the museum to explain the, the, to the visitors and also for the artists or house historians. So we managed through the technology to tell this story in 30 seconds and catch the attention and also give people that are in the museum also something that they can take with them. Because, you know, the visit to the museum becomes then an experience. Um, and from the feedback that we received from most um, people visiting the museum, and I was very surprised to see that there were also people that weren't so tech savvy, <laughs> um, or maybe also a bit older, they were fascinated and saying, this is amazing, I didn't know. And if you really look closer, you can see that the, the bits of the original color, which is beneath. Um, and I think this is again, um, what we talked about before, on creating something that is sustainable and it's not about the technology. That's so cool. Uh, well, next time I go to Vienna, I'll definitely have to go. And it, it, I love the immersive storytelling part because, I mean, this is just what I get excited about, like new forms of expression and storytelling and kind of how you were describing that. I was thinking like, you know, sometimes at museums, I'll go to like Wikipedia pages and get like the backstory and you go down these rabbit holes, but you're bringing it all together in one 30 second immersive storytelling clip uh, in in a compelling way. So I, I think that's just uh, so neat and fascinating. And in, in addition to uh, the museum case study, I'd love to hear maybe some stories about independent artists and how they're using the platform too, because you make it really, really easy for any artist to be, you're almost like the Canva of AI, uh, of AR for bringing artworks alive, because it's so easy to use. So I'd love to hear some um, stories or use cases from independent uh, artists as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, it's it's hard. Um, also, you know, to to know um, what everybody is doing. Um, I'm, I'm trying um, to get into you know the, in touch with so many artists um, as possible because we have this amazing community. Um, but um, I think I have a, a great example. So two examples that moved me personally um, were uh, on one hand a traditional artist who's doing a landscape. So is painting landscapes and um, he's um, doing very well and sells wonderfully in, in the UK. And um, I had a call with him and he told me, it's like, I'm so happy that I found you <laughs> um, because I'm putting so much passion and I have so much joy creating these paintings. And um, when, when I'm done um, with the painting, I'm not really interested in that anymore. And I see people that are buying this result and putting it on the wall without knowing how much joy I had. So he came uh, with the idea, I think he's like 80. So he's using the computer for emails and for artifacts, <laughs> funny enough. So he came with the idea, um, he um, had like an older digital camera, just put it on a tripod. Um, to create the time lapse and said, I just let it run um, so people can see from the first stroke to the last one, um, you know, how the colors came and how much time I put in the details and, you know, how, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied with the, with the process and when the artwork is finished. And people can see this. So I can, I can show them for every artwork that they're buying how it was made and how much work it is inside and how much joy I had with it. And that made him happier, you know, to, to tell the story in a way which people also can understand and also that they can rewatch it and they can also share it with other people. So when somebody is coming and visiting and seeing the artwork, they can also share the experience on how the artwork was made. Um, and I think it's like, you know, this is so touching because it, um, it is so true because if you're seeing an artwork, you just see the end result <laughs> uh, and you don't see the process. Um, and sometimes the process is so interesting and um, it, it takes so much time into um, 
artist putting into the detail. And um, you have a total different relationship with the artist, with the artwork, if you see how it was made, and you can maybe see some details that maybe are hidden um, if you wouldn't um, see the whole process. It goes back to the story and uh, knowing, and this is one reason why I love uh, getting to interview the artist, is getting into the process, the creative process and the mind that went into the art. And you totally have a different appreciation for art. Uh, if I mean, you can appreciate art at face value, but I know I get so much more out of it with the context and understanding uh, the artist story. So I, I love that you bring uh, this alive in such a, a rich, immersive way. That's that's a very valid point because for visual art, um, you know, on one part is the visual aspect, obviously, uh, but you're deciding on buying an artwork because of the story, because of the artist, because of what it's representing. And it's much easier to tell this story if you have a digital, you know, extension or you can connect it to a digital, um, you know, um, storytelling tool, <laughs> I would say, because then you can, you know, um, relate much easier. And then it's becoming emotional and then it's not, just an artwork, but it's a story. It's um, um, an experience, and um, because I was I was um, saying at the beginning that um, you know um, I, I want to highlight two stories. The second one uh, was from the other side. <laughs> um, so, a digital artist um, who um, has a lot of success with NFTs um, and also selling his digital art um, had a first. Um, real or like you know um, in a gallery exhibition without screens with artifact was a part of um, um, a group exhibition and uh, we launched it in Vienna and uh, we had uh, amazing feedback and at the end um, obviously people could also buy the NFTs and also get the print so that they have the whole experience again um, so they could you know hang the NFT at home and through the phone uh, bring it to life so they didn't have to invest a lot on screens or having screens that are running the, the whole time. And at the end, um, we, we still had some, some artworks and um, the artist came to me and said, um, is it okay if I take uh, one of my artworks home because I want to show my parents what I'm doing? <laughs> so he was already successful uh, and, uh, you know, living out of um, the work that he's doing. Uh, but he wanted to take something that he can hold in his hands and go proudly home um, to show to his parents uh, what he's actually creating. So, um, you know, there are, the whole story with NFTs that will not get into it, but still having something in hand, some, having something that you can, you know, put on, on the wall, something that it's um, there and you can, uh, can see it um, also without electricity has a different meaning for us. Yeah, I, I love that. And I've, you know, been in digital media for over 14 years. And it is funny of like, what, what do I produce it? It's all in pixels and you're missing <laughs> the, the haptic of like, this, this is what I've done with my career. So uh, <laughs> I, I love that you're kind of bringing digital artists back into uh, tactile artwork as well. Um, well, and I guess just you mentioned NFTs, uh, which yeah, we'll we'll save that for another another episode. But um, you know, you're really so much at the cutting edge of AR um, AR and bringing art to life. I'm really curious. You mentioned uh, you know the goggles. Oh, I'm really curious what Apple's Vision Pro will do. You know, to kick back start all of the. They're not using the words metaverse anymore, but all of these immersive experiences and extended reality, like what, what's next? Like, where do you see where both you're going with Art of Ive, but just like the industry and artists and, uh, and technology moving forward? Um, I, I think art is always um, a mirror of the society. So right? we'll always use um, what's um, close to us and then um, also part of the uh, culture. And um we see that um, the technology is moving very fast. Um, and I think what Apple is doing right is they're not talking so much about the technology and trying to give it, you know, names <laughs> um, because people still have a hard time to understand, you know, the whole digital space and, you know, what's digital, what's real. Um, and I think um, another good example is on, um, you know, how complex um, Google Maps works on, on the phone. Um, so you want to get from A to B, 
um, and Google Maps will help you to, you know, find um, the best way of transportation if it's, you know, with a car or with a bike or public transportation. And you also got your fastest there. Um, from the moment that you want, you know, you put in the address and to the moment that you arrive there, you don't think um, about the technology that, or technologies that were used. <laughs> Uh, you just want, you know, to get there. And maybe when you got there, you also forgot that you used Google Maps. So I think this is how we should and will interact with technology in, in, in the future. People will not really care if it's something that they put on their face or if it's the, the smartphone, right? They will go for the experience. And what I like about um, Apple um, is they showed cases uh, where it makes a lot of sense, right? So um, if you're at home and want to, to watch a movie alone, and this is a very important part because for these headsets um, is something that you um, they're meant to, to be experienced alone, um, you can, you know, make your TV bigger or maybe you don't need a TV screen at home anymore if you have the glasses. Um, if you um, want to, to work on an airplane um, and you don't want anybody to, to see into your laptop and you don't also have the space for it, you can use the goggles again. Um, if you're working from the office and you need more screens because you have a lot of ideas and pin walls and everything is digital, you can use the glasses again. And I think that's the most important part because people will not care that they're using the glasses. They will just, you know, use it because it's private, because um, it's, you know, saving space and they don't have to take the laptop with them. Or they can use it um, in a uh, working environment that they're getting um, a, a little bit, uh, you know, um, um, better <laughs> and, and faster to the result that they were searching for. Um, so I think this is where um, we will go um, based on um, the, the hardware and software that will be developed. And I think it's um, also very important that, um, you know, for the companies and for the projects, um, coming out there, um, they're focusing on the value that they're creating and not on the resolution and the number of sensors and um, how light or heavy it is, but just on how will, will it make our life better. And at the same time, when we have these gadgets, art will adapt, coming back to the idea that, you know, it's a mirror of our society at the same time, um, it will um, talk about you know the problems, the good and the bad things in our life, and then the creatives will use these tools as well. Um, so I'm I'm curious myself um, to see where the road goes. Um, I think with the glasses um, from the Google glasses, which were in 2014, 13, 14, uh, we hear is like next year, <laughs> but next year will be there. Next year everybody will use, <laughs> um, and this is for ten years now. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest problem because we didn't really find um, the value where glasses will change totally um, the way how we, we interact with content uh, compared to the smartphone or to the laptop or to the different devices that we have. Yeah, I, I find it so fascinating if you look back at the just the rocket growth of Facebook, like what actually was the biggest uh, thing that catapulted Facebook was the ability to tag your friends and photos and making photos a social uh, experience. Like that was the big thing and such a simple idea. And then fast forward to chat GPT, it's natural language and just the ease and use yeah. of interacting with it with natural language. And, you know, they're both free and not you know, huge expense and the accessibility of it. So I'll, I'll really be interested in the accessibility of these, of the hardware and the devices and like, what's that simple thing that they, that they tap into. Um, Cause I think the more simple, the better the adoption is of, of the tech and as well. Exactly. That's, that's very important. So people shouldn't, again, think about the technology. Also with ChatGPT, they're not thinking, you know, that they are, you know, um, talking to, to an AI, they just want um, an answer. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's easier than uh, maybe Googling it. And the same thing is uh, with Facebook. They just wanted to show where they are and how cool they are and how, you know, 
they're all friends together with the tagging and with the liking. Um, and that's, you know, human behavior. Um, and they weren't really thinking about how much data they're sharing, uh, where the pictures are going. They, they just wanted to, to have um, the, the value and experience. Yeah, and, and I will say with Google Maps, I don't know if it's rolled out everywhere, uh, but for as much as I travel, I my sense of direction is absolutely horrible. Uh, and I'll go in, friends joke, uh, when I travel, like any direction I want to go, we go the exact opposite and that will be the right one. Uh, but with Google Maps, if you have, if you're walking on the street and put up the phone, um, it will literally, instead of the blue dot, which I still can get lost with the blue dot telling you where to go, it will literally, <laughs> if you put the phone up to your face and point the camera, uh, using maps, it will have arrows of like, walk this way. <laughs> and I was like, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> uh, and it's the the utility of it and the ease of use also is such like a great onboarding tool, um, at least for Google Maps and AR. So if you haven't exactly. tried that yet, I encourage people no, to. I, I try it and it's, uh, it's amazing because um, it shows you the, the direction, right? And you can also see in, in which direction um, something is positioned or you have to walk. Um, and again, it's like people don't care that it's AR. Yeah. It's like the camera just helps you to see where you're at and which direction you should go. And if it keeps me uh, in the right direction, it can keep anyone in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, before we sign off, um, you have a couple of upcoming events uh, that you'll be at in your own virtual conference. So uh, tell us about some of the, the things that you have in the pipeline. Um, my pleasure. So we um, first will be now in October the EWE, which is the Augmented World Expo, uh, for the first time in Vienna. It's like um, um, a fair and conference that um, is around 15 years, if not longer. Um, and we're more than happy that it's in our hometown. We also have a playground there. I will also have a keynote. Um, so whoever is in town and um, will join, uh, pink me. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to drink a coffee and see you there. And we also have a hybrid, more online um, summit coming beginning of November um, on the 7th, 8th, and 9th, um, where we'll talk about augmented reality art from all sides on how to make money, how to tell stories with it. We have people from um, Disney uh, joining. We have people that um, are Emmy Award winners. We have people from Harvard. Um, so um, join us. It will be an amazing three-day uh, full of talks, panels, um, inspiration, and also a great way to, to network. Fantastic. And I'll be sure to put all the links to all of this again in the dedicated episode uh, blog post. Um, and if you want our listeners and viewers to remember one thing, either about Artivive or our conversation or about AR or immersive art or whatever you would like, what would the one thing that you'd like them to remember uh, to be? I would um, maybe ask a question. Um, and this is a question that um, we are somewhat trying to, to answer or we, or we think that we have the answer, uh, but still is... Um, Last and every century has its own art form. Um, and last century we had photography and film, the first century where technology started to become an, become an art form. Um, and my question is, what will be the art form of the 21st century? I love that question. What a great way. I feel like that could actually catapult a whole nother uh, episode to dive into that. Uh, but I know uh, uh, we're a little bit at time. So uh, Sergio, it has been so wonderful to have you on the, epi uh, on the show. And we'll definitely bring you back so that we can dive more into that because uh, you've got me all excited and we have to sign off. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much. It was so much fun. Um, I don't know how the time flew so fast. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, that um, it was for everybody enjoyable and looking forward to the next episode. Likewise. Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're just getting started and would love your support. Subscribe to Creativity Squared on your preferred podcast platform and leave a review. It really helps. 
And I'd love to hear your feedback. What topics are you thinking about and want to dive into more? I invite you to visit creativitysquared.com to let me know. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter so you can easily stay on top of all the latest news at the intersection of AI and creativity. Because it's so important to support artists, 10% of all revenue Creativity Squared generates will go to ArtsWave, a nationally recognized nonprofit that supports over 100 arts organizations. Become a premium newsletter subscriber or leave a tip on the website to support this project and ArtsWave. And premium newsletter subscribers will receive NFTs of episode cover art and more extras to say thank you for helping bring my dream to life. And a big, big thank you to everyone who's offered their time, energy, and encouragement and support so far. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. This show is produced and made possible by the team at Play Audio Agency. Until next week, keep creating.